Uh, hello, everyone. This is the Cluster API intro, deep dive, and future. So it's a lot to, to cover, um, but we'll start by introducing ourselves. I'm Vince. I'm a software engineer at Apple, um, and I'm also SIG Cluster Lifecycle co-chair and controller runtime maintainer. Controller runtime and Cluster API maintainer. I'm Christian. I'm a software engineer at Broadcom, and I'm a Cluster API maintainer. All right. So what is the vision for this project? This project started like almost like seven years ago. Um, and the, the vision overall was to build the meta cloud. What it, we're getting really close to what it is today, which is we have declarative APIs. They're production ready. So you can use them today in your production workloads. And we want to make managing these clusters and fleet of clusters as easy as possible. So you should be able to upgrade them. You should be able to make sure that like, your cluster and nodes will all be all always up. So if you all are offering a cluster as a service solution or like for other, which is a common use case, Cluster API is your friend. One of the key things that I keep repeating, I have another slide too about this. Um, we make the 80% use case possible, it, simple, and the 20% possible. What does this mean? If you go into the core of Cluster API, you will see that there's a lot of batteries included. We want to make sure that you can just start using the project as fast as possible, and you can create a cluster. So for example, if you go to the quick start, you can create a cluster in your local Docker environment using kind. And that will look exactly the same as like a cluster using AWS. Extension points, docking ports. What does this mean? So like a lot of times, like a um, a lot of people come in with new features and use cases that they would like to add. What we do usually is like we sit down and like we, we try to, in, in an open discussion forum, we try to make these features like making sure that like they're as generic as possible. And if something doesn't fit in core, we make sure that there is an extension for it so you can build it outside. This is kind of the overall definition. We have Kubernetes-style APIs, which means we use Kubernetes to create Kubernetes clusters. The most beautiful thing about Cluster API that I'll keep repeating that I love the most is that Cluster API clusters can manage themselves. So you can have one cluster that's managing itself and a fleet of other clusters. We want to make Cluster Lifecycle boring, which kind of goes against, you know, as being a chair of Cluster Lifecycle, it's like, okay, what does this really mean? It means that like, when you create a cluster, a lot of like, the problems that come like, with the cluster lifecycle, they should be as easy as possible, or should be flags or fields that you can set. Extensibility is the key. So when we talk about like, cloud providers, everybody should be able to choose their own. And in fact, like, that is like a main concept in Cluster API, where you can bring your own, you can use one that's already built from the community, and we have a long list of supported providers, like AWS, Azure, Google, like R1. And there is also like a smaller ones that like will let you bring up clusters in bare metal. I touched this a little, batteries included. The, when you go into the repo, the first thing that you will see is that like we use kubedm, which is within the cluster lifecycle, we use kubedm to create these clusters and manage the lifecycle of clusters. The biggest thing that, that you will see also is that we manage control planes, and we try to do that safely. When KCP, QBDM control plane, it's included in Cluster API, and you can use it today to create scalable control planes. What happens during an upgrade? There's a lot of operation that happen during an upgrade that like, need to be managed safely. So for example, who has been burned here by like, an etcd member leader election? We try to do that safely within Kubernetes control plane, so that when you roll out like a new, a new control plane from one version to the other, we run an extensive amount of checks to make sure all the versions are what they should be. It is production ready. It has been used like by, there is a blog post that was uh, put together like a few years ago when we went to production ready, where a lot of companies put in their use cases and how they use it in production. I'll touch a little bit more on this later, but the best, our best feature is the community. The, this product like, a, wouldn't, wouldn't be here if it was for like, all of you, like a given feedback, contributing in like, any shape or form. Here's like, a, some high-level numbers. This is just the last year. 
While cluster API is rich in maturity, so like these, these contributions like are starting to, to slow down from what we have seen in previous years, we have had to almost 24,000 contributions that are, are with commits, comments, PR reviews. People are really coming together. There is 350 active committers that have committed it at least like once like in, the, in the repository. And across all the cluster API repository, we have reached like almost 5,000 5, stars. So how does it work? As I mentioned, like you have a management cluster that can manage all, all of the other clusters. The goal here is to make sure that you can span all your cloud providers. So you can really be agnostic. Now, there will be differences between how these providers behave, but we do have contracts in place and we run some sort of conformance for Cluster API itself so that the base operations, for example, scaling up your node pools, auto scaling them as well, they, they behave exactly the same across these clouds and bare metal. There's a lot on this slide, but as I mentioned, everything has to be plugable. So when we talk about core controllers, we have the cluster, machine deployment, machine set, and machines. This kind of resembles something that you probably already know, which is Kubernetes deployments. So you have a deployment, a replica set, and pods usually, in this context instead, we're managing actual machines. So for example, in AWS, the infra cluster in here and the, and the controllers will be the AWS controllers. And that's just an example. And your machine will be EC2 machines. There's also other things that you can do today with the introduction of manage services, which is to manage also EKS clusters and GKE clusters with this. The bootstrapping part is one of the most interesting, and Christian will talk soon about what's coming next there as well which is, how do you bootstrap a node? Today, there is, there is some issues that came up like with the bootstrapping part, and then you can see the kubeadm is the one that's built in. We tried to make sure that like when we started this project that the, the kubeadm configuration for both for control plane and worker nodes would behave as, as close as possible to, to all cloud providers, and also across operating systems, which makes it a really hard problem to solve. But by making, making this a unique problem, now we have some issues like with the OS and Kubernetes bootstrapping because they're one. So we're trying to eventually separate these concerns so that you can update your operating systems outside of like your kubelet. Christian? Yeah, so what about the future? Um, currently one big point is the transition to later on hopefully a v1 API version, but the first step now is to get to a v1 beta 2 version because we're currently at v1 beta 1. But to take a step back, we define as one of our goals to have a declarative API to manage the life cycle of all the clusters. And we have a huge umbrella issue regarding API changes we want to do. That's not something we can, could do now and directly go to a v1 in our, in our opinion. So. What we're currently doing is, um, with v1 beta 2 is, the main goal is to improve status of our cluster API resources um, with the target of making it easier to understand in what state my cluster or my machines are um, and also make it more easy to, tr to troubleshoot issues or bubble up issues to the actual user without him uh, knowing the exact details and how cluster API works. Because there are lots of folks building on top of Cluster API and aren't able to know all the details below that. Um, for introducing that, we have a proposal um, and one more detail about how we want to do it is um, we will do a multi-step approach. We won't immediately go to a v1 beta 2 and into introducing this new information um, because we want it fast um, and to gather faster user feedback or and also be able to use it earlier, um, we will start having new fields in the v1 beta 1 API, for example, at the dot status v1 beta 2 um, field, which includes, for example, new conditions. Um, we already have conditions, but we also want to yeah, converge and use what upstream Kubernetes does, for example, and um, have the meta v1 conditions API types instead of running our own conditions. Um, and yeah. So, get more to uh, the common standard uh, which is used across um, 
yeah, the landscape. Now, we plan to have this into the v109 release um, and currently hardly working on getting all that into uh, the release. Um, so there will be lots of new stuff there. It's not only about conditions, it's also about other fields like replicas or so on. Um, and the second step then would be maybe around April next year to introduce a v1 beta 2 API type or API version. Um, we will still have some fields then in status deprecated, which we want to get rid of in future, but we still want to keep them around to be able to convert back and forth for the v1 beta 1 version, because users might still use that old, old version and need time to um, yeah, migrate the new one into the new fields. As last step, probably one year after we introduced um, the v1 beta 2 API version, um, we're planning to drop these fields in the v1 beta 2 API type. Um, that's also maybe the, or probably the time in, point in time where we also stop serving v1 beta 1. So um, the conversion aspect of converting from v1 beta 1 up to v1 beta 2 is um, not a use case anymore. Or the other way around. Um, if you want more details, um, there's that proposal is pretty huge and contains lots of details and um, yeah, feel free to read up there. So I now just talked about these new status fields, but and I said there's a huge umbrella issue with API changes. There are things in there like adding new fields for fields cube ADM introduced into their configuration. Um, there's stuff in there and we need to figure out what's important for us, for you, for everyone in the community. Um, and need feedback and help to implement all the stuff, which is important. Um, not everything will make it into a v1 beta 2 and might be postponed to a later version or might get re-evaluated, -evalu so, um, yeah. Other changes upcoming in the next Q um, cluster API version. I want to highlight one thing, which is um, we improved our drain behavior in cluster API with v1.9. Um, Actually, this is the pull request which introduced that. Before, we did simply use the same as kubectl drain that did. We even used the, the functions um, which kubectl also uses. But kubectl drain is a CLI and we're running a controller. And that was not written in a way which is um, good for a controller. We have a retry loop um, using controller runtime when removing machines. And for example, um, the old code did um, create lots of go routines when draining pods. It, it was one go routine per pod which was created um, and when removing multiple machines at the same time, which means deleting much more pods at the same time, um, this didn't scale very good. It was good enough as of today, but um, that one, yeah, is also more efficient for us. Introducing this um, was good, but we found an issue right after introducing it. Um, which was, if you run pods on a workload cluster which have toleration set to ignore all kind of tames set on nodes, um, we would drain that pod and the scheduler might reschedule it right to this very same node again. And our new code would try to re-enter into the drain and see, hey, we have to get rid of that pod. And it would re-enter and re-enter again. So we would be stuck draining that machine and getting rid of that, of that machine. Um, so for that, we need a way to say, okay, me as an operator of the management fleet or for, of all the workload clusters, I know there's this kind of pods running there and I want to skip them getting drained because I know I can't drain them. Um, it's similar to what is already done, or there, there are already pods which are ignored today, which are, for example, pods coming from daemon sets, which would have the same behavior, and um, kubectl drain also ignores pods from daemon sets. So. Um, yeah. And, and one thing to note about Drain is like this was like one of the most, I guess, community driven features that like we, we took like a lot of input in and like fo folks like uh, really drove it like because we need to really improve like how we do Drain safely to make sure that the cluster behaves properly. Because if, if you have customers that like you're offering like clusters too, the first thing that, that they'll, they'll ask is like, okay, but what, what happens during a maintenance event? How do I know that I need to move my pod somewhere else? And how can I do it safely? 
this has been like a huge improvement. And the note on that too is like, there's also a cap upstream that's trying to solve some of this. Um, and we're trying to feed input like on what we found in Cluster API. Yeah, and one more point to the drain. Um, what this also improved is the status we have when in the machine when it's getting deleted. And we can, we can now report up that, for example, a PDB is blocking a pod from getting drained. And that's the reason why the machine still exists and is not yet removed. So to solve this issue with these pods, we came up with a proposal and an implementation of a CR called machine drain rules. And as Vin said, there were more use cases than only skipping um, draining pods. Um, there was also the use case brought up via issues in our re repository, which was, I have an application running in my workload cluster, and I need to ensure that this one is the last one which is getting drained in my cluster when the machine gets de deprovisioned. Um, or it could also be the other way around. I have certain pods I want to get drained first. Um, so that's the second use case the machine drain rules try to accomplish. And um, maybe to show a quick example, this is, we implemented this using a CR, um, which is a namespace CR. And you can define a drain spec which says, okay, I either want to skip pods I want to select or I want to set a certain drain order. And you can create multiple machine drain rules selecting different kind of pods. So also different teams could define their own machine drain rules if they have to. Um, and then select uh, basically in the management cluster based on either you want to apply this rule to all machines in this namespace or to a, a subset of machines in this namespace or to specific clusters in this namespace or even to specific machines of a specific cluster. That's the power of uh, the selectors we have here. And of course, there's also the workload side where you can select, okay, certain, this machine drain rule should um, apply for certain pods in a namespace of um, a workload cluster. So that's the angle of the operator of the cluster, like I'm having the machine, uh, the management cluster in my hands. If I'm an application team and maybe only have access to the workload cluster and to my pods, we also have a label now in place which also allows you to say, okay, I know this pod is gonna tolerate all kind of things. Um, I want to say, hey, cluster API, if you are draining this machine, just ignore this pod. I know what I'm doing um, and just ignore it. Um, to note, that's only a feature of draining via cluster APIs. It has nothing to do uh, with kubectl drain. We open an issue though to maybe have a standard there in future. So that was about re um, recent feature. There's another topic I want to talk shortly about, which is in-place upgrades. That's something often coming up in the community um, as a thing, but first to take a step back, in cluster API, we love immutability because um, yeah, it's predictable, consistent. We can easily reason about what, what's happening or what's the desired state. Um, and one good thing about that, which is also the same like for running containers via pods is, um, we prevent machines for getting a snowflake. Like earlier we managed everything, maybe running SSH and installing things. And if I've, each machine may, might yeah, have difference then, that's something we um, have kind of solved um, using cluster API, as long as you don't SSH in afterwards, of course. Um, and we already do some in-place um, stuff with cluster API, like we propagate down fields if you change something on a machine deployment, um, like labels of machines, it gets propagated down to the machine object without needing a, a whole rollout. There's also something, for example, when machines get deprovisioned where we change something of the node in the workload cluster, which is setting a certain taint that new pods might not get scheduled preferred on the, to that node. So we kind of already do some in-place things, but yeah, and that's the huge but. It doesn't solve everything. So there may, might be other complex um, use cases like I have my VMs and I just want to scale up CPU or just want to scale up memory. Um, scaling down would be a whole different thing again because, yeah, do I have enough resources to scale down? Scale up is a kind of, of an easier one, but that's currently not possible with cluster API and other use cases for sure too. And 
here the huge disclaimer. Um, we have a proposal here that one is still work in progress. progress. It needs feedback and contributions from the community uh, to make it happen. Um, it's kind of, we kind of try to address this problem in a way which is extendable um, and because there's no one um, solution for this whole problem. Um, and yeah, I don't want to dig deeper into that now because um, I think that could deserve a whole other talk or workshops and so on. Um, but yeah, feel free to read up there, um, engage uh, and help on making it happen if it's important for you. Yeah, and with that, um, I think we're at the end of the talk, but happy to take questions. We should have some time for it. Yeah, 10 minutes. Also, there's the QR code for providing feedback to the talk. I think there's a microphone in the middle if uh, folks want to. Hey, everybody. Great, uh, great talk. Thanks for this. Um, so, for people who run a large amount of infrastructure, a, lot of, uh, a large amount of clusters today, what do you folks recommend the migration path being to cluster API? That's a great question. It, it always comes down to like, it's like a lot of the use cases, like, for example, there has been talks like about like adopting old clusters that has not been yet like in either implemented or thought about. Um, in the past, what we have seen is like folks lift and shift because they have like operators on top of it that like can do that. Like, or like, for example, you have an Argo deployment, Flux and whatnot that can do so. Uh, it is an interesting topic and it will drive adoption. Uh, I know it's a known answer, but it's like something that we have discussed a long time ago. I know there was a kind of POC to kind of at least migrate first the control plane part, which is the, the, the most like a crucial one. Um, and he was doing so like by joining the control planes into the current one and then over, over migrating over. And then you would just like scale down and scale, scale up new node pools in, in that context. Okay, yeah. thanks. I want to add to that. Um, so there's no general approach, there, but there was also a talk from Mercedes, um, I think two and a half years ago in Valencia at KubeCon, um, where they tried to explain how they migrated using the OpenStack provider. Um, but that's very special to every environment and how it was set up previously, because you need to kind of test your own um, upgrade path and if it works for you, so. Yeah. Sure, thanks. If there are no any other questions, I think we can call it. We'll be available around for, for yeah, feel free for to reach time. out. Thank you.